class is in session. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Unlearn 16. I almost forgot the name of my own show. It's been a morning already, obviously. Class is in session. I am here with the very talented, very funny comedian, Lisa Baker. How are you doing this morning, hon? I'm good. I'm good. I'm tired, but I'm good. You're tired. You're just on tour. So tell our listeners, our viewers, a little bit about who you are, where you're from, what you do, why you're so damn funny. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm from Newfoundland. I think the puffins yeah. make you funny, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm originally from Newfoundland. I lived there for 35 years and then, uh, moved to Alberta almost nine years ago now, uh, just about 44 at this point. And, um, I, uh, yeah, I started there and then I came out West and then, uh, over during the pandemic, my career, like I'd been doing pretty well. Um, I was successful by Canadian comedy standards. So I was getting the credits, uh, I was doing all of the things that we want to we want to do. I was making money, but I still had a day job. I was a single parent, and then um, during the pandemic, my career blew up uh, via TikTok. And there it then, is, yeah. And then when uh, when the pandemic, uh, like when we started, you know, saying okay, we can kind of do live shows and stuff again, I immediately booked a tour. So I've been touring pretty much since July, the end of July. But the last um, say well, about eight weeks have been. Um, heavily focused on the East Coast and Ontario. So that's, yeah, that's where I am now. The joys <laughs> of TikTok. Yeah. Um, TikTok has this amazing ability to find amazing, talented people and just push them to the surface. And yeah. whereas everybody else, I'm assuming, was telling you no or taking a pass or not quite, well, I don't really know. You know, we talk about musicians, we talk about comedians and actors and stuff. So all the world's taking a pass on all these people until they prove to these gatekeepers, look, look at the audience I've built. And all of a sudden, right, you have, you're the, the golden well, child. Yeah, well, because at the end of the day, it's about money, right? So clubs yeah. look at it as um, comedians who are a draw, of course, get preferential treatment, right? So if they know you're going to put asses in seats and they're like, they'll do whatever they can for you. So when I started doing the tour, I financed all of it on my own. Uh, I did yeah. use a few comedy clubs and did door deals. But for the most part, I booked venues that were willing to let me take all of the ticket sales. They would get the food and alcohol. Um, and then I would pay my ex and I would finance everything, but it, uh, cause I had opening acts as well. Um, that's a whole other thing too. Cause I paid oh. people incredibly fairly way above and like what the industry standards are. But, yeah. um, the, I just felt like I wanted to stay away from like, there's some government theaters and stuff, but I wanted to stay away from that because, okay. um, I wanted to support the local businesses that have been struggling for the last, you know, almost two years. Basically. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the plan. But yeah, until you show a venue, like anyone, like you said, these gatekeepers, unless you, sh until you show them, you know, I'm a draw and I'm going to put asses in seats. They don't even care about your talent mm -mm. at that point. They just want, they want it's dollars. Right. And, and, and I mean, fair enough, you're a business person. I get it. But yeah, it doesn't matter how funny you are. They want, they're like, no, no, you got to do all of this stuff first and prove to us right. that you're worth it. And so COVID and TikTok, is that when you joined? You joined like all the rest of us at the beginning of- I, I, well, I, No, I joined in January of this year. And well, that's it. Yeah. And I just really started kind of posting. I posted a video here and there. And then March, my TikTok started to just kind of blow up. And it was all because my my 19-year-old daughter was like, you should be on TikTok. Like, I think you do good with it. And I was like, I am yeah. too old for that stuff. And then I just, I came on to TikTok uh, strictly as um, to consume the content. And then ended up, you know, posting my own. And actually, I, you were one of the first, because um, there was a few uh, creators I followed, um, you know, just going through the For You page. And you were mm -hmm. one of the first. Um, there was a few that I've been following, like, pretty much since I joined, which is really cool. Well, that's nice. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, just that content, right? If I'm coming to your show, what what are your... What are your sticks? What are you? What's your focus? What's your vibe? I mean, you you got to sell that accent because everybody's gonna love that. But yeah, what's well, your yeah. the accent is there? My stuff. It's basically, it's sort of like across. It's a uh, observational humor, uh, but storyteller like Newfoundlanders are notorious storytellers, um, and uh, I try to just focus on stuff that. Um, is, is just very real and authentic in my life, uh, you know, relationships, dating, um, all that kind of stuff. But it's like just to be a woman in the world, you know, like, yeah, um, absolutely, and especially a middle-aged woman in the world. And so um, the weird thing is, is when I, like when I did the Toronto show, looking out over the audience, I remember thinking like, Jesus Christ, like 
it was so diverse like that, like from, you know, 20 year olds to, you know, you know, grandmas and uh, people of all colors, all, you know, all genders, all uh, sexual orientations. And I was just thinking like, cause I, at first I thought I resonate with middle-aged women, but now I'm like, what is my target audience? And I feel like it's just people who just want to hear something that's truthful and that's honest. There it is. And that's, I'm not a dickhead. I'm not a dickhead. Yes. Right. Yes. Authenticity. You know what I mean? We are so tired, whether it's in the political sphere, the the acting sphere, we are so tired of manufactured entities. We are starved for authenticity. And in the absence of good authenticity, we'll take any ass, um, politically yeah. speaking, um, who we think are being authentic, but we are starved for authenticity for sure. Uh, and I think a perspective of a, just a, maybe a not as quite aggressive and, and angry perspective of what it is to be a woman in this society. And I know that you've said like, it ain't easy in the, in the business. What, no. what, what have you come up against? Like, well, I mean, some, some of the stuff that you, you know, I, for very early on in my career, I remember doing a comedy competition one time and this guy who was in the competition with me and I had, I had uh, moved on to the next round and he said to me one night we're at a, we met, I just met like banged into him at a bar and we're drinking. And uh, I was with the, a guy I was seeing at the time and he comes up and he goes, you know, when you compete in a comedy competition, you're only competing against the other women. And I said, Oh, and he goes, yeah, like that's how that works. They don't, they're not really judging you against the men. I said, well, that's interesting because I beat you and I'm the only woman in the finals. So like who else Am I like who else is, right. you know? Yeah. So, and then, you know, I've had people say things like, um, I'm not comfortable with female headliner for years. There was a, almost, a, not- yeah, there was an unspoken rule for years that, uh, you couldn't have three women on a show. So if you had a show that had, you know, the host, the opening act and the headliner, it, at most you could have two women and that was pushing it. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's I mean, a I- change, but I think that goes back to seats in the, like butts in the seat, right? Because they're assuming, and again, we can compare this to so many different avenues, whether it's in the acting realm or whatever, because they assume that the guys are the, guys are draw for guys. Women can't be a draw for men. Right. You know, I've been in I've been in the music industry a little bit over my life and not as a singer, good God, no, but (laughs) I've seen it and you see it and you always hear from like, especially if they're gay artists or whatever, like you still need to invite the men. I'm like, why? Why is everything we do about what appeals to that demographic? There's 50%, even if they don't want to see it, there's 50% of the population. Why are we only feeding to that? You well, know what I'm saying? There's the other end of it too is even as a business person, um, when you look at, especially something like um, definitely comedy, when you think of a comedy show, it's almost it's almost uh, almost always uh, like a date night activity, right? Mm-hmm. And if yeah, you're talking, absolutely. Right. And so if you're talking, let's take like just, you know, you're straight couples. So we're talking about these dudes. Um, who's buying those tickets? Who's planning most date nights? It's not men. Mm-hmm. It's almost always mm-hmm. women. And when men do go see, when a man goes to buy um, a ticket to an event like a comedy show or you know, some, some kind of a live performance. It's definitely something that's catered more towards him. However, um, that's not all, it's not always the case. You know what I mean? Like, um, and, but there are men that, that follow me that come up to me at shows and say like, Oh my God, I love watching your videos. And so I Mm -hmm. think like, we're really doing men a disservice when we say that. And I think men should be pissed off to think that people think that they're so narrow minded that they could never enjoy watching a female comic because I had a guy say to me once and he was a, like a, like a booker, very low end booker. And he said, uh, I just don't find women's material relatable. And I said, well, you know what? I can appreciate that. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, you've never, you know, left your house, had a conversation with another human being, watched any sort of, you know, movies or television, consumed any media, used the internet, you know, just never interacted with another person in your life. I can understand how you would feel that way. However, you're just regurgitating a stereotype. Mm-hmm. That's all you're doing. Absolutely. And it's interesting. And, and when I when I think about it in the comedy spectrum and then I apply it to bigger life, it's just the way that I think. I also think that 
the groups, not just women, but any, any person of color or sexual orientation or whatever division of society we're talking about, the more outside of the norm you are, in my opinion, the clearer you see the whole picture. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I think you can be funnier. And you can be funnier because you can see all of the streams coming at you at all of the times. The only reason the people sitting in that nice little, you know, straight, heterosexual, white, Christian, rich bubble, they're just pissed about it because they don't want to be made fun of. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, everybody sees a little bit more clearly as soon as you bring, you know, that perspective into the room. Absolutely. And like one of my favorite things to do is to watch comics that who's, um, you know, not just that their their sort of delivery and their um, stand up is very different from mine. Um, I, I appreciate like watching other people sort of create their art in a different way from what I'm used to. But I'm also I also find it really cool to um, to just be um, exposed to things that I've never I'm I'm not familiar with. I grew up on an island in the middle of the North Atlantic. You know what I mean? So when I go to a show and there's a comic who's talking about, you know, growing up Muslim, or there's a comic who's talking about, um, you know, being transgender or uh, being gay or whatever. Like all of this is so outside of what I grew up with. Right. And I just feel like it, um, it's just, it's refreshing to hear another perspective. It's, mm-hmm. you know, and just, con- and also too, I really feel like it, um, what's the, like, it sort of helps um, get a, get rid of those biases because a lot oh, of people have biases yeah. against, yeah, they have biases against a, an idea, right? So like, I don't support, I, I think being gay is terrible. And then you meet someone who's gay and you like them and then you're like, oh, well now there's a face to this. It's not a, just a concept in my brain. There's a right. living brain, breathing person here. And of course that doesn't work for everybody. Some people are, are idiots and they're bigots and that, that's what they are. But, you know, we can change people by, you know, having them see all that diversity for sure. What do you think? I mean, this is a really hard question. I don't know if we'll find an answer to it, but what do you think the difference is? Like you've sought out that difference. You're, you're, you like that difference. You want to be exposed to that difference. And you grew up in a very small town on, on an island off the East Coast. You know what I mean? You grew up in, in very typical when people talk about small, secl- in, you know, secluded towns, that's where you were. Why do you think you have purposefully sought out diversity and difference? I and, think, and, and maybe somebody else won't and can't. I think, well, I think for me, it's my whole life feeling like I belong. Like, you know that that Christmas movie with the Island of Misfit Toys? Um, Do I know it? I'm going to bring in all of my toys. They're all downstairs. Well, that's, Do I know it? That's how I feel. Like, I grew, I always felt like I didn't fit. I didn't, where do I fit? Where do I belong? And right. I say that as a woman. As, as a fucking white woman. Do you know what mm. I mean? Like I say that as like the, you know, and I'm a middle-aged white woman. We have almost mm-hmm. as much privilege now as the men, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and I mean, I'm in a, I'm in a heterosexual relationship. Um, I've never experienced, other than like poverty, I've never really experienced any kind of. I think poverty and, and not having money, that's a significant one, right? I, th- I really think that's, that's a, a, Like, because we're not just talking about, you know, not having money to buy a new, you know, jacket. If you're talking about really not having money and feeling like on the brink of not surviving or making it, that that you've been pushed out of the bubble right there. So I'm wondering. I lived in government housing on welfare like 15 years ago. So, you know, it's just, wow. I just, and, and just knowing how that felt to be just judged by that. But that was something I could change. That mm-hmm. was something that can be changed about me. That wasn't right. something that was, you know, just me, me right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't anything, it wasn't my personality. It wasn't something like it, it was, it was something that was completely in, within my control to change, mm-hmm. which meant that once I changed that, all of that shit went away. And that mm-hmm. some people don't, a lot of people don't have that option. And right. so I guess I felt this sort of like empathy in that I know um, what it felt like for me to be judged and to be treated differently for something, but I could control that something. And so I can't you know even what? imagine yeah. what it must feel like to be in a situation where you can't even change your circumstance. And you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't right. have to. And I think with, with talking about class and talking about that judgment, I still say there's something incredibly unique about you because 
um, and we see this time and time and time again, that people are marginalized, people are oppressed, people who are, whatever their reason they've been pushed out, there's a tendency, and this is, the I think, one of the biggest problems, to find somebody else to oppress. All right, they oppressed me. I feel like garbage. I'm going to go find somebody else. So we see awesome. all of these communities turn on each other, even within the community, like the, the LGBTQ plus community can be pretty horrible to one another. Whether yes. you're a gay man, a gay woman, bi, trans, like there's all of these divisions and you watch them all attack each other for different reasons. And then you, and then if you step back, you're like, guys, listen, <laughs> we aren't the collective enemy, but what the majority culture has done brilliantly is divided and conquered. So we scream and swear at each other and we never collectively look Absolutely. at them. Absolutely. Right? And it's, and that's so like, to me, that's the, this, the tragic part. And, and it, you see it everywhere. Like when you see someone mm -hmm. post a meme about like, why are my diabetes medications $400? But you know, um, a drug addicts can get, was it the Narcan or whatever, the thing that mm -hmm. saves them from, you know, over to, why is that free? And it's like, okay, it's, both those Missing things can be free. Both those things can be free. Why are exactly. we, we do not have to step on another person who's just as, in just a shitty situation or being treated just as terribly to build our, like that's, that's not how you should do that because right. now you're no better than the oppressor. You're no better. And that's how they've set up the game. They've that's set up the it. game as an either or I'm the government. I have $8 billion to spend. It's an either or scenario. Why are we never speaking about our military budget? And should we? Right. Well, that conversation doesn't happen. The United oh, States, just, heaven forbid how much money oh they God. spend. Right. And we've and our governments have convinced people that the people that are costing the governments the most money are the people that are looking for, you know, um, a, like a, a living wage or a medic, you know, free medication or dental or whatever. Yes. The people who are asking for, you know, um, health care or um, equity programs. Right. So, you know, just to check some balances to make sure that you know, biases aren't being used in places of employment or within healthcare or any of that stuff or education. And so that's the biggest um, scam the government's ever pulled on us is for all, to make us believe that that's where all the money is going. It's not even, not even close to where the mm -hmm. money is going. Absolutely. And I, yeah, it, setting up those structures and those dichotomies and those either or scenarios is just the way that we keep yelling at each other for funding and the way that we keep, you know, I think about the indigenous community, obviously Canada, our history is God awful. Oh God. And, and the, the experiences I've had with many different communities and many different nations, and you watch how there has been set up competition for this nation to get something or this nation to get something or people within the nation to get something. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh, this, it sh there should be no competition, none, right. but right. they've done that to you, you know? Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. And it, and to look outside of yourself and to sort of see and to, and to pass on that empathy, I think is huge. But as a comedian, I think comedians, first of all, have an incredible amount of empathy. And, in, and at the end of the day, if, if you're good, you, you're, <laughs> very good at reflecting something of society. Otherwise you wouldn't resonate. Right. Well, that's the thing you're trying to be, I mean, depending on what kind of comic you are, but like for the most part, the vast majority of us are in a position where, cause like my thing is people are, cause there's always, I, you're around, when you're around comics, comics always talk about, well, the point of stand up comedy and the point of comedy is, and the point of comedy is to make people laugh. That there is, it is. The absolute point of comedy. I don't care how you do it. But that is the point. It's I, I, I'm not obligated to educate or do this or do that. But my kind of comedy is to um, I, I, I won't punch down. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I want, to, I want to come back to that. Yeah, we'll I, back to I refuse that. to um, I refuse to further marginalize marginalized individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I I want to point out the ridiculousness of some stuff. Uh, I do kind of go after men a lot in my stand. Not in a, men never have a problem with it. They think it's hilarious because I just point out the ridiculousness of it. You know, like the whole, just the way, I mean, like if you look at uh, stand up is predominantly male dominated, um, but even in fields that aren't nursing, teaching, 
uh, social work that are pro- predominantly female dominated fields, the chances are your manager is probably still going to be a man. Uh huh. Yeah. And so it's like, even though, people or, yep. yeah. So even though statistically, when you look at the, just the numbers, it's like, well, the math indicates it should, a female should be in this position just, just by the numbers of it. Um, but right. it's, it's not all, it's actually most times it's not the case. And it's, um, you know, cause we're punished for all kinds of things, right? Um, we're punished for, punished for the potential to make children, not even for making them, not even for wanting to make them, but for That's having that potential. Yeah. Just because. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, then the notion that people question when women are going to have children, therefore I'm not going to elect you to this position or I'm not going to appoint you. I'm not going to promote you to partner of a law firm because you're in your low thirties. You haven't had kids yet, but I know you're going to. And when you do, you're going to chuck your career. Right. Like it's no, way. yeah, like, come on, Marion, we can all hear your clock ticking. Like, there you know, go. it's just the most ridiculous thing. Cause you know, and, and even if a woman does decide to have children, um, it shouldn't be something that she's penalized for. It shouldn't be something that she shouldn't lose things because of that. Um, right. certainly not in this day and age, you know what I mean? And to be, yeah. and, and, and it, honestly too, to be in the, in the, the job that I'm in as a, a stand-up comic, cause now this is my only job. Like I quit my full-time Amazing. job in September. Fantastic. And, um, yeah. So this is my only job, but, um, you know, it's funny because even when people find out like I'm a feminist and I was like, well, you if you you can't work outside of your house and not be a feminist. You can't exercise your right to vote and not be a feminist. You cannot. They don't like the name. They don't, they don't like the word. No, there's a, and that's another thing where we've been convinced that it's an awful, awful thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all these feminists are, you know, and it's like, that's not the case. Um, you, you, you know, just by sheer, um, almost by sheer existence, you are a feminist. Um, right. you know, if you want to do, yeah, if you want to do anything, if you want to drive a car, if you want to, you know, wear a dress or put on a lipstick, like if you have any kind of autonomy, you are a feminist, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, and cause, and that, cause that's how you got there. But like even that kind of stuff, cause people think, you know, oh, if I go in and watch this comedy, it's going to be this and that, you know, whatever. But I mean, it's, it's where we are in the world at this point, you know, like I think women, we're just, women are just fed up and we're in these shitty male dominated fields and we're just, we're like, no, I belong here. There is a mm-hmm. space for me here. Yeah, absolutely. And so that brings us back down to this, this idea of punching down. So very recently, and we'll talk about it a little bit, obviously Dave Chappelle put out um, his series on Netflix. Yes. I hadn't watched it. I'm going to admit something to you, Lisa. So don't hate me too much. I don't watch a lot of comedy. I find people that I love and that I'm drawn to, but I, if I'm sitting at home, I'm not clicking on comedian after comedian after comedian. I don't watch a lot of it. When I heard about the whole Dave Chappelle thing, I hadn't watched, I hadn't watched his series on Netflix and everybody kept asking my opinion. I'm like, guys, I, I can't give you an opinion because I haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, do I love the fact that people walked out of Netflix and Netflix fired them? Of course not. But I, I, I still need to watch it. So I watched three episodes or whatever, three stand up routines, um, including the closer, which he got a lot of you know, the most trouble for or whatever, yeah. but I think he's been facing it for, for a long time. Uh, the only thing like, and again, I support, and I want to talk about punching down, but I support everybody's viewpoint on comedy and everybody's viewpoint on Dave Chappelle. But when I watched those three episodes, what I, my first thought was, why do you keep reusing material? That was my, first, <laughs> my first thing was I heard these jokes already in your last episode so why i just thought it was lazy the, th- um, well, the thing with because the thing is with dave chappelle um because he is um at his core dave Ch- dave chappelle is a brilliant comedian he really is yeah. um he is a brilliant brilliant comedian however um you know you can be you, you can be brilliant and also be um not maybe not be as um open-minded as of you course. should be that's yes so Absolutely. if there's, you know, that kind of thing going on, but I feel like, um, when I, cause I watched the first two and I tried to watch the third one and, uh, the thing you never was, got to the end of the closer, you never got I to never, the end of it. I never really watched it in, in its entirety either. I watched okay. bits and pieces, but the thing I found with Dave Chappelle fans is they're a little crazy. 
Um, Dave Chappelle fans are a little crazy because they're, um, the thing is like, I've had like musicians, for example, that I've supported all, you know, I've been like, oh, I love their music mm-hmm. and then they'll put out a song and I'm like, okay, that's a hot steam and pile of garbage. Right, right, it, was, right. it wasn't for me. But with yeah. Dave Chappelle, they so just, they're just, just so die hard. Oh God. They're so vicious in their defense of him. And the yeah. thing is, um, with, with Dave Chappelle, like I said, and I mean, he's just, cause they're like canceled. I'm like, Dave Chappelle is not at any risk of being canceled. No, fine. of course. Um, and every like, cancel culture is so horrible. I'm like, cancel culture is capitalism. Thing. It's not yet. It's capitalism. Thing. The only reason anybody ever gets canceled, canceled by anybody like any company, any anybody is because they're not making the money anymore. If they're not making the money anymore, people are stopped. They're not buying their crap for whatever reason. That's capitalism. Yeah, and, That's the, it. and the other like, thing is, because it, it's uh, you're 100% right, it's a business thing. Either they're not making the money or in the case of, say, Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, you know, they're costing, they're costing money, right? So whenever they become, they get to the point where they're either not making the money or they're costing people money, you know, in the way, in, in the way of, you know, like lawsuits and stuff like that, uh, being a liability. As long as you're not a liability and you're making yep. money, you will have a career. It doesn't matter what you do. And we've, yep. we've seen that. Um, Mike Tyson is a convicted rapist who served time and still has a career. So let's, where's the cancel call? So many people, so many people, we so can go many through people that. Have right? been- Chris Brown, Chris Brown. I mean, I can't, I can't talk about, you know, so many different people will have careers um, and have done horrible things. Now, going well, back Louis to something you said Louis earlier. C. Louis C.K. still has a career, by the way. Of course he does. Yeah. Of course he does. Going back to something you, so here, how do you reconcile these two things? So I watched Dave Chappelle. Now I am not trans, so I get it. We're there's two, we're two women here. Uh, I happen to be gay, but we're two women here that are speaking to an issue. And I know some people will get prickly about this that doesn't reflect me. I get that. I hundred yeah. percent get that. So I'm cautious about that in the first place. But but how do we reconcile a comedian's job is to make people laugh, and you should never punch down. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're still making people laugh, and in my head, it immediately comes to Ricky Gervais, because Ricky Gervais will say horribly offensive things about everybody. He's co- and if you're a white straight dude, let's be honest, you're always punching down. Pretty much, Maybe, right? You're always punching down. I joked about about the whole Dave Chappelle thing, and I thought. Well, you know, he's he's an African American man living in the United States, and and this whole trans is he punching laterally at this point? I don't know. Well, because like, is he punching down or? Well, it's it's it goes back to my example about because that's the thing too. Like when people ask me about it, a lot of times I'm like, you know, as a white <laughs> white straight presenting woman, <laughs> let's I'm uh, you know born female, identify as female. Um, I I don't feel like I have. Uh, I definitely don't have a, a dog in the fight either. Do you know what I mean? Like I definitely don't, there's, and there's no reason for me to, you know, but in the sense of just taking the, um, the issue, which the issue is, uh, one marginalized group, uh, attacking another marginalized group. Now, mm-hmm. the other thing is, is that within the other marginalized group, there are members of the first marginalized group, right? Sure. I know black there's trans, all this overlap. Absolutely. Yeah. And black trans women are having such a huge issue with what Dave Chappelle is saying. And, and I feel like that we need to, we, we really need to listen to them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we need, we need to hear what they're saying. And uh, I just feel like it's the same thing we were talking about earlier. It's, we've been, we've been, we've been tricked into believing it's okay to trample down another group to highlight our own issues. And that's in any kind of way. So women, trampling on because you have the turfs who are you know like um the feminists who are trans exclusionary so i got called know. that the other day <laughs> i'm like okay wow okay yeah but yeah, was, you know, yeah but that's the thing right like and and it's the same thing so if you get a feminist who are like we I mean, are we're fighting for equity for women and then we're like, and then it's like oh well trans women oh no not those women like that's a hundred percent right yeah. and it's the same kind of idea and i think like you see it in so many different areas and I think mm-hmm. it's just absolutely, whenever I see someone say, well, oh yeah, fine, they're going through this, but what about us? We went through it. And it's like, you know, we can, we can kind of recognize, 
um, all of the things, you know, we don't need to ignore one person's struggle and just highlight another or, or pretend that their struggle is not as important when these are serious. These are really serious issues that both groups of people are facing. Look, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about the gay jokes. So, so I'm going to put the trans issues aside for a second, because again, not trans. I knew some people might think that I'm trans, but I'm not. So I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to talk about people who aren't gay and make lesbian jokes. I don't know if I'm so inherently offended. I just don't like, um, you know, I've heard there, there are some stuff that's just funny. You know what I mean? So if you're, if you're, like some of those jokes and observances and things like that, I can recognize as being funny, even coming out of the mouth of a straight man, even coming out of the mouth of a straight woman, even coming out of the mouth of an African American. It doesn't seem to matter to me because funny's funny. So when Ricky Gervais has his diet, I mean, let's be honest, there nobody is safe from his comedy. Not a single person. No. Um, not a single person. And, and he's okay with that. He's like, if I'm funny, people laugh. And if they don't laugh, good, I'm done. That's that. Then that's it for me. Yeah. But does that mean somebody who's not a lesbian get never gets to make a lesbian joke? No, no, because there's, so here's the thing, like. What's the line? Yeah. I'm yeah, trying to understand. Well, it's, it's like context and content are important because okay. you can't like. So there was this joke, I haven't done it in a while. I used to do really well too, but I used to do this joke, joke about a friend of mine who was really upset about the fact that he had to pay for his medication. But where he lived, the government paid for um, uh, gender reassignment surgery. So that okay. made him really mad. And I was like, why? And he goes, well, like I can't get you know insulin, but I can get a new vagina. And I was like, huh, I could use a new vagina. That's funny. And then I do this joke about like how worn out my vagina is. You know, and I think, and to, like, and, but it's just highlighting the ridiculousness of, right. you know, like who really gives a shit? You know what I mean? Like you don't need to knock down another group just to show your, you know, so there is a way to talk about certain issues and topics, um, about, um, you know, that are sensitive in nature and that you don't, you know, you certainly don't want to alienate people in a right. way that is still funny. You know, and not um, not just shock value or just you know, because I'm because mm -hmm. to me that's lazy. That's very lazy to do jokes that are just strictly offensive for offense sake. Now, what about here's my other question? What about the black trans community that think Dave Chappelle's funny? Because the whole point of the closer was this was the the person that he knew, unfortunately, who um, committed suicide. And mm. that was the, he told this story and he's okay. like, yeah, that was the end of the story. And he said the end of the story, it wasn't, you know, his jokes about the community. It was how the trans community turned on this individual because she was supporting Dave Chappelle mm -hmm. and got inundated with hate. And he's like, guys, I don't, I don't get it here. Like, and, and at that point in his comedy, again, I'm having a hard time reconciling it all because I laughed at his lesbian jokes. I thought they were funny. But, and then I listened to that whole, that whole arc, right? And that's another thing about comedians. We love to pull 30 seconds out of what they say yes. and we don't listen to the arc. That's a right. problem. It is. Because, because you don't get the end of the joke. Yeah, context is important, right? But, well, for mm -hmm. me on the whole thing, like my, because I'm not, it's not my world. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like my role is to sit and listen to what all sides are saying that are actually living in that world. And then my role as a white woman, um, I felt like over, like uh, over the last few years, I've been, you know, trying to read and learn more and, and listen to people so that I can just say, look, I'm here. Tell me what my role is in this. You mm -hmm. know, is it to stand behind you? Is it to stand beside you? Are there times you're going to need me to stand in front of you? Um, mm -hmm. But I will just be the best ally that I can be. Um, but you need to tell me how to do that, you know, just because I don't, I don't, I need to know where I'm needed. You know what I mean? So yeah, I yeah. feel like that's my, my place in all of this is to not even be able, like, I mean, I certainly, I can give the you know opinion of, I don't think that we should, you know, knock down one group to build another and all of that kind of stuff. But when it comes right down to how people within those marginalized groups feel about jokes about their community, um, I just need to listen to their 
sort of their reasoning and what, you know, cause that's the thing too. Like there's so many times, like when you, you hear something, people are like, well, that's kind of racist. And you're like, oh, is how? And then it's explained to you and you're like, oh, I didn't oh, know that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's honestly, if there's anything that we should be doing at this point is just like sitting down, shutting up and listening. Um, mm. We've had our turn uh, a lot. Uh, yeah. We've had all of it. And so at this point, I feel like that's my role is just to listen. Um, and so I haven't been weighing in a lot on the Dave Chappelle stuff just because it's not, yeah. it's not my world, but I, 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 all the white dudes are though. I can tell you right now, all the white dudes yeah. are, yeah, sure, right? Sure. But, but I'm just trying to step into, like, it's just sort of getting this idea. And uh, number one, I'm not a big fan of censorship, period. I don't no. like it. I don't like who controls it. We never, we never benefit from it. But then I go back to, because I'm a political student at heart, I go back to just because the majority likes it. So if that's what we're judging it by, because comedians say, if the masses laugh, right? Just because the majority thinks it's funny, that doesn't necessarily make it right either. Because no. the majority has done some pretty awful things in this country. Well, and then there's the, what about the situation you're in? Like, we, like, okay, so we can say the majority, if the majority think it's funny, then it's funny, right? But if I'm telling racist jokes in um, a place that has like an active KKK presence, the Here majority go. are going to laugh. Yeah. So you can't even say if the majority, because it also depends on, so what audience are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Who's in that audience? But again, if we can't, like, oh, picking and choosing what we're going to censor, we're not going to do that. But I think what it does and what it does brilliantly, and if I were Dave Chappelle, this is how I would have handled it. I would have sat down with, with uh, that community. I would have sat down with that community. I, I would have sorted it out. But, I mean, that's not his job. He's a comedian, not no, a politician. Well, no, but the other thing is, too, like, because, that's you know, like, I can sit here as a comic, and, and I mean, certainly, I'm not fucking Dave Chappelle, but, like, as a comic, I can sit here and go, well, you know, I'm going to, this thing that has absolutely no effect on my life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write an hour on it. And fuck it, I'm going to write mm -hmm. another hour on it. Again, has no effect on my life. It's not my world. Why, was interesting. why even talk about it? At first, why he talks about it? We're told, first rule, talk about what you know. That's the first thing we're you told. Know, you know why he talks about it? And we're going to go right back to the beginning. It's so funny. We're going to go right back to the beginning of this conversation. It's about dividing and conquering. So if you can put African-American men over here, right? That culture, that group, that whatever. And you can put trans men and women. Well, predominantly he's talking about women. Trans women over here. And you can have them come at each other, right? They're forgetting that it's not about who's been more oppressed because Dave Chappelle talks a hell of a lot about what white trans people can get away with and the power that they've wielded because it sounds like he cares about the comparison. That's what the underlying thing sounded like to me. Mm. He still has, there's still 16 year old boys, black boys getting shot in the back and, yeah. and he's negating, he, and I don't know how he does this. This is my problem. Don't you dare negate the violence that community's faced. Don't, don't you dare. But he, but he doesn't know, but he doesn't know, but he lives in a society where my oppression is worse than yours. Right. And he sound, he sounded, he and, and he sounded, what, angry. yeah. And so, and the thing is too, like, no matter how much money or education you have or how worldly you are or anything like that, we're humans and we have our biases and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. some of us try to actively work on those biases. Some of us don't even realize we have them until they're pointed out. Um, yeah. But it, it, it is what it is. It's because we have all of that stuff that's been passed down to us, those things that we hear that are in our ear, that are in the media, everything else. And so sometimes you can kind of fall victim to that. So I just don't like me, myself as a comic, as an, as an artist, I talk about what I know. If something enters my world, um, let's say you and I were out one day and there was some kind of something came up. Uh, some mm -hmm. kind of situation came up while we were out eating or something like, I'll talk about that because I was there. I was present. That happened. Or if you're my friend and you're telling me something and I have a take on it and I, I'll talk about that, but I won't spend a ton of time on something that I'm not, um, really living in because that's right. not my world. And I feel like it just really runs the risk of me sounding ignorant, which is why right. for a lot of stuff, I just go, I don't really have an opinion on that specific thing. However, the 
the the issue with that specific thing is much broader and it's this and I have an opinion on this. Um, mm-hmm. which again, is that like infighting within communities or amongst communities that really would be much power, more powerful if they work together. Absolutely. But, and, and again, a lot of people, and I'm using Dave only because it's, it's been so timely, That's but everybody's coming down on, on Dave Chappelle, but like, and I get it. I mean, this is a great conversation to highlight why it's an issue, but nobody's, you, you get a few tweets or a few whatever about Ricky Gervais. But he's made a lot of trans jokes. He has, yeah. A lot. Yeah. A lot. You know what I mean? He's backed up J.K. Rowling. He's made a lot. And he's like, yeah, I'm not. And he doesn't even come close to apologizing for it. But nobody, there weren't forces of people seemingly come after him. And then and then in my head, I'm like, is that because he's white and he gets away with it? I mean. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to say it's not, you know. You got to take in all of these, all of these elements, right? Like I've listened, you know, obviously I grew up on, on the Seinfeld show. And so watching his stand up and watching how he, if you watch his old stand up, look, there's a lot of stuff in there. That's just not okay anymore. Right. Yeah, there is, stuff so doesn't watch, age well sometimes. Yeah. Right. And so you watch that and you say, well, that's not okay. Then how much do you still carry it on now? And and all of those things become problematic, but you've never seen this onslaught against his kind of comedy either. No. Um, no. So I'm just, yeah. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. No. No. And, and he's it's, worth yeah, a billion. And yeah. And I, and also, cause I mean, Dave Chappelle is a very successful stand up. He used to have the Dave Chappelle show on TV and he walked away from that. Um, but Ricky Gervais still has his hand in everything. Yeah. You know, he's got oh, every, yeah, yeah. He's his hand and everything. And so it's just astounding to me, yeah, that he's not being called out in the same manner. Um right. That Dave So then you go back, you go back to who gets called out, what marginalized group fixates on another one, and it seems like there's a competition for trying to trying to take back that power. And it and it's no different. And I'll and I'll speak within the gay and lesbian community and all of the other subsequent letters. Um, it's no different than when you hear, let's say, lesbians bad mouthing gay men or vice versa, or both getting on, you know, not not liking so much people who are bisexual. Like those jokes are never ending. Yeah. Um, uh, and then there's the whole transgendered and uh debate and and who gets to say what? Somebody, I made a TikTok the other day, a little while ago, and somebody, I don't know, somebody always questions my my sex and, and uses the word gender inappropriately and whatever. And I always, you know, <clears throat> have a bit of fun with them. But I said something in there. They said, I said, well, I'm a lesbian and I like sleeping with women who have women parts. And then, because that was the way I was defining lesbian. But then I had a few comments um, and I've answered directly, but a few comments from the trans community say, wow, that sounds transphobic. And I'm like, well, it does. It, it it seems like it might sound like that. And then I had to reflect on that and figure out, okay, but how are we ever going to have categories? You know what yeah, I mean? Then what lesbianism, if it's not, right, yeah. what, what is the category of, of that now? And, and then I kind of got lost in that. I got, and, and and I'm in the community, so I can only imagine what people outside outside of the community, what people that live in areas that have never even spoken to somebody who is gay or lesbian, never even spoken to somebody that's trans, trying to wrestle with all these incredibly complex, overwhelming um, identities. And yeah, well, because like the thing with me, like for example, like my partner's, you know, he's a total dude, um, but. <laughs> If he woke up tomorrow and said, you know, I, I feel like I identify as a woman, mm-hmm. my only question would be, okay, you so you feel like you're a woman and you want to live that. Um, how do you feel about me? And if he said, oh my God, I still love you. I'm still attracted to you. I still want to be with you. I'd be like, okay, well then how can I support you through what you're going through? And we yeah. would remain a couple. I, I don't care um, mm-hmm. what parts he has or how he dresses or what he looks like. Which my daughter informed me means I'm pansexual. Because <laughs> I didn't I didn't know. So that's the other thing. So if you were to say as a lesbian, I'm attracted to um uh women, you know, that have the you know, the women parts or whatever, 
I feel like that's... I didn't know how else to define it. I just felt like I was just defining yeah, it. Yeah, what lesbianism like, is. Yeah, and I feel like if you said, like, I'm attracted to women, people who, who present as women, regardless, then I don't know if that's... No, I didn't, but I didn't say that. I didn't say the way, because that wasn't the point of my whole thing. My whole no, you were thing, just saying, like, you were just trying to be like, oh, I'm a lesbian. I, I sleep with women. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And so I just, yeah, I feel like, yeah, if... um. I don't know. I feel like maybe we should just maybe we should just scrap the whole thing and just be like, I'm sex fluid, whatever that means. Well, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. Then I start having sex an issue with every really single bad, letter. Though. <laughs> with, with every single letter of that al- alphabet, right? Like if Anna came up to me now and said, you know, um, oh, but I, you know, I'd like, I'm gonna, I'm trans. I, I believe that I'm, you know, a male. I'm gonna present that way yeah. or whatever. I'd be like, okay, and you're absolutely right. I would go nowhere. I would right? go nowhere as long as she, no, no. As long as there's I still the, go. as long as the intimacy and the love is still there, like, I could not leave him. I love him. So that's, you know. that's the point. But that's the point. Yeah. We are always talking about attraction from a distance. Right. When we decide on our sexuality, in my opinion, it is attraction from a distance. It is, I look at you and I find you attractive, whatever that means to me. But when you fall in love with somebody and you actually understand what intimacy and attraction is, because it's not that, then it's the person. Then I'm wondering how many of us, if we can throw out all the socialization garbage in our head, how many of us would cease to care? Especially, yeah, like if you could take out, like you just said, if you could take out any of the bullshit you'd have to deal with, the idiot family members with their mama. If you yeah. got, if, in a perfect world, if somebody could um, wake up in the morning and be like, um, no, I'm, I'm definitely not, I'm not living what I, as I should be. And I need mm-hmm. to live this way instead. And there yeah. was no judgment and there was no nothing. Yeah. I, I'm curious to know how many of us would just go, cool. I'm still yeah. here. Cause I know I would be like, Brett is, I like he, I would never leave him unless he would have to do something awful. Um, Mm -hmm. and to me, any, like those things are not awful. They're just, they're, yeah, it's, that's not awful. Like that's just, who cares? That's not a big deal. Yeah. It comes down to what their soul is. So a lot of people ask me, you know, how did I know I was gay? I dated guys forever, yada, yada, yada. And I said, because when I dated guys, I loved guys. Like I dated some great guys that I was even attracted, but there was an intimacy connection that was missing. Mm -hmm. So I felt really alone and that's the best way I can describe it. And they were lovely people. And when I started dating women, I felt that it was this, this underlying connection. Now it wasn't an underlying intimacy connection because they had a vagina. That makes no sense. It was an underlying intimate connection, probably because of their life, our shared life experience because of socialization, which is hilarious. And there's something about women that I connected more deeply to, which allowed me not just to be attracted to you across the room, but allowed me to be really attracted to you and connected to you for a long period of time. Yes. And then you start to realize, holy crap, we are all pain. Like we just have to be, that fluidity is there. But it's the socialization that have forced women into certain boxes, certain roles, certain experiences, that that's what I'm attracted to, I think. I Yeah, and I think, too, it depends on, like, Brett is a very, um, like, for as a man, he's a very, um, he's very open-minded. He's very, um, uh, he's very progressive, considering mm-hmm. he's an Alberta-born and raised man, he's very and worked in the oil patch for God knows how long. Like it's just very surprising. But yeah. he's also um, very open with me. Like just, and if I have like a meltdown where I'm like laying in the corner, I'm crying. Brett doesn't walk away from that. He comes, he picks me up, he holds me, dusts me off, he builds me back up, you know, and and. And he gives me the room I need to grow. He supports my independence. He doesn't treat me like I'm someone he has to take care of. And I feel mm-hmm. like those are the things that I needed. And you, there don't, you, go. you don't get it a lot from because of the way men are raised. That's it. Socialization. A hundred percent. We don't get that a lot. There it is. It's so funny. On uh, 
and I and I've thought about this a lot because I talk a lot about the social construction of gender. I talk a lot about that. I talk a lot about how people who especially push heterosexuality and say it's the only way, it's the only way women should be women, men should be men. And I think to myself, you guys are done stupid. Here's why. You're teaching men and women to speak different languages and be different people and experience the world differently. And then you're wondering why they can't get together and stay together for more than 10 minutes. And you see this influx of people being attracted to the same sex. You guys caused it. Yeah. Right? One of the things. Norm, that functionalism, that enforced categories and roles that caused it. That caused it or that perpetuated it. I mean, we can talk about whether you're born gay or not or whatever. I don't really care to ever have that conversation because I don't care. But I'm telling you right now, when you, the whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Remember that book? Yeah. We did that. We did. And when people say like, let men be men and women, like, what does that even mean? What does that mean? We've never Nobody has ever let men be men and let women be women. We have made men to be men and women to be women. We have made that. We have enforced that with every conversation, every toy, every piece of clothing. We enforce that. So when people say like, you know, oh, I just, I, I never would, or this is, I'm just comfortable. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm feminine. That's who I am, Joanna. I, I'm not, I'm like, but we really should be questioning all of it. And we can't really step outside of socialization ever. We can't. It's around, it's, it's inundating. Yeah. yeah. And like, even me, like I used to do, I used to work in the trades. And so like you go to work, um, you know, in jeans and work boots and, you know, I, yeah. your hair is up and everyone, um, I remember wearing two bras so that my chest was flatter and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. Just, you know, and for support too, but also, so my chest was flatter. Um, and just, just trying. And then, but at the, you know, after work, you know, you go out and have, you know, uh, we're like, well, we're going to meet up for dinner Friday night or whatever. So we all go hang out. Now I'm wearing a dress and heels and my hair is done. I'm full makeup. And there's no reason you can't be all kinds oh, of okay. things in, in the run of a day, in the run of one yes. day. There it is. There it is. I have, um, change many fire students. on your way to getting your nails done. There we go. And, and that it's like, not only do we have to fit into category A and B, which is why I hate binary so much and it gives me heart palpitations. But even if we're trying to fit into a category that we don't necessarily fit easily into because we want to be in this category or we identify as this category, we're still shoving ourselves in a category. We are. We, we, we constantly are. <laughs> and so... I mean, I really do. I, I have some things set up so I can speak to some people from the trans community because I think it's interesting. I used to have a very good friend who was a trans or is a trans man. I haven't spoken to him in a while. <laughs> and he always said trans man. And I said, Dan, why don't you just ever say man? He goes, well, because I'm something else. He goes, for 25 years, I was a woman. For 25 years, I lived a reality, whether I felt that way or not, I lived a reality as a woman that gave me experience and perspective and a, and a sense of self, whether I wanted it or not. That's right. And now I physically transferred, you know, transitioned into a man, but I'm something better. And, it, and it's funny. It's like, he's like, I'm something better because now I've seen it from both sides. I, I am something else. I don't want to sit in a binary anymore. Because I can see life from over here and from over here, and I'm drawing upon all of that perspective to create my identity here. And I was yeah. just like blown away. And that's and that's actually a really cool, uh, like that's really Perception. cool. Yeah, just to think about like how you know someone who's lived on like both sides of it, and then because every experience shapes you into who you are. And then to yeah. have had the both experiences, and then kind of combine that into one person. Like, yeah, that is something quite uh, quite different. Uh, and quite special, really, when you think about it. Absolutely. Well, I think, I mean, we started talking about comedy, but I think we pretty much solved a lot of world problems. Uh, <laughs> we should wow. probably roll up into the UN, start talking about it. What's what's next on your tour? So if people want to find you. Well, you just go, what, if you go to my website, lisabakercomedy.com, um, and you click like the drop down all my tour, because I have another tour starting at the end of January. Um, amazing so all of that all of the shows are there um you can buy my albums my merch uh we did we're waiting to hear now because we did submit my album was submitted to the junos so we're <gasps> hoping that i get nominated for the comedy album um, amazing yeah i just if i like i said i was like well if i get nominated i would love it because 
regardless, no one can ever take that from me. It's a nominated album. Absolutely. But that's if huge. I win, if I win it, I'm going to be insufferable. I said, like, I'll just be walking around the house, like answering the door to get my pizza. Like, oh, this, sure. this is just my Juno. Just, over. It's just, just my put Juno it around over. a very large chain on your neck. Well, and the other thing is because during this, when I was booking shows, I had a venue say to me, um, very misogynistically, but had said, of course. We did, we, uh, and someone I knew in the industry who should know better, who said that I had not yet proven myself. And uh, I was like, you, if for you to say that, you have no idea what's going on in Canadian comedy right now. But I said, yeah. if I win the Juno, I'm just going to send him a picture of it and say, how about now? Just right on the back. How about now? How about now? So yeah, Check. there's that. But yeah, if you go to my website, you can see everything I'm doing. I'm filming in April in Newfoundland. There's a... It's going to be like a pilot. I don't know if it's going to take off, go anywhere. Um, but Amazing. Yeah, so I have that coming up. And then probably another cross-country tour this summer. We're going to drive across the country and do that. Um, Fantastic. And what is your TikTok handle for those at home? Uh, Lisa Baker Comedy. That's everything. My website, my <laughs> Instagram, TikTok, everything is Lisa Baker Comedy. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Thank Thanks you for, for this. Me. Very cool conversation. Uh, what What's the funniest thing about living in Edmonton before we go? The funniest thing about living in Edmonton? Well, something's got to be funny. No. <laughs> the Oilers, I guess. Like, you have an NHL team. I'm like, do we? Do we? <laughs> do we, though? So I'm going to get some hate mail for that, but that's okay. Yep. That's coming in the mail. Yeah, that's all right. Lisa, thank you so much for hanging out. And uh, I guess I will see all of you guys next week on Tuesday. Same bat time, same bat channel. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get sued for that at some point. But satire. not yet. Just say it's satire. Today is not today. <laughs> Have a good day, guys. Dismissed.